Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland International and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined by friend of the show and France second row, Paul Willemsen, shortly as well. Let's chat about how the Six Nations went from a French perspective. How was your week first day, Johnny? You were doing the dreaded word corporate at the big one, weren't you? The required word corporate, mate. That's how I pay my mortgage at the moment. Ching ching. Um, uh, I, wa- I was at the big one, mate. The big one, Scotland, Italy. Normally the wooden spoon decider. Not this year. Um, I made a great day out. Franco Smith, former Italy coach, who's working wonders with Glasgow Warriors with us. The Bergomasco brothers were with us. Um, and to be honest, from a Scottish perspective, it was squeaky bum time because at 79 minutes, Italy probably should have won that game. Um, length of the try, score for Blair Kinghorn sort of made the result a little bit more flattering than probably it should have been. So look, great day out again. Um, uh, Mrs. and the kids happy to have me back in a bit more time at home, be the same situation really? in your house. <laughs> not really, not really. <laughs> I'm just happy not to be in any more planes, trains, and automobiles and get a bit of downtime. So mate, loved it. Six Nations, as always, is class. An amazing tournament. Great to be part of it. Great to have some fun, catch up with old mates from all the different nations. Um, but it's done for this year until next year. Um, but yeah, loved it. Got back Sunday, basically slept for two days, and now <laughs> back with you mate good times absolutely and that's more than enough on scotland same old story for them too eh? much too yeah. much mate <laughs> too much let's not go over it again we're done france we will get paul's view more importantly very shortly yes. but just briefly was that a good way to round off the tournament against wales or will they be slightly disappointed that they sort of let wales back in a little bit in the second half well I'll let them back in but like when they turn it on they're on like when france are on and their players are firing like they've got depth now of top draw talent in key positions um, and they're organized properly and when you get that blend blend of timing rhythm pace and power and organization it all comes together um they are right up there like obviously top two teams in the world but so good to watch and they, they blew wales away that that was the the truth of it for big periods of that game there was one team on the field um Again, some of the boys you go through, Dupont and Tamak, Dante, Fiku, like when they all get together and they're working together behind the pack that's going forward, they're frightening to watch. Anton Dupont, who again was omnipresent, monstrous and everything he got through, um, he's just a freak. Like they're lucky to have him. He's the best player in the world. Um, will they be a little bit disappointed that it snuck away at the end? I know Sean Edwards will because he's a competitor and he's a defence coach and it's another four tries that they've conceded. But the game was out of sight. And I think mentally they knew the game had been won. Um, but I just, I don't see them with the three, four months of prep they've got ahead of them and a World Cup on the line. I don't see those defensive errors being made or the sort of effort errors, which will be the thing that pisses him off more um, and falling off tackles where if your life depended on it, Penn will be bringing him down and they won't be scoring that try with um, with 30 seconds to go. So, mate, good way to finish. Finish with a bang. Um, and I think to have gone up through the gears through the competition as well to start with tricky game against Italy which wasn't easy um, but to finish in front of your fans to have smashed England at Twickenham and to finish with a big win at um, at the Stade de France uh, yeah they'll be they'll be happy Right let's get an inside view on things now then and we can have a chat with a man who was injured for the final game that played a massive role in the rest of the tournament friend of the show Paul Willems that joins us how you doing? Hey thanks thanks and you guys We're good we're good how is the hamstring and when are you back mate? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a niggling injury for a while now. So I've had it through the whole tournament and stuff. So I wasn't really that happy um, or that surprised when it finally went because I've I've had difficulties for a while now with it. So when it finally it finally went, I was like, oh, it was probably um, ahead of me. So yeah, so I t- took it on the chin, and now I'm just busy coming back. It's not too bad. Just a small niggling thing, so I'm just like I think it's two, two or three more weeks, and it will be fine. Okay, and is that the kind of thing? Was it just tightness? You were struggling for a while, and then it properly went, or no? So I did it during the November tests. So just I did the first week of uh, preparations, and then the week of the first game, the Australian game, I think. Um, the Wednesday training, I I tore it a little bit, but it's every time it's like a, a grade one day. So it's not bad, but if you continue, you, you will tear your hamstring. So like every time it's just three weeks, okay, just for the whole November test series. And then I came back, you know, for the Six Nations. But since then, it was always just to come back to be good enough to play. 
but then eventually like you adapt during the the training sessions during the week so eventually you go your level of your hamstring goes a bit down so i think that's what happened but yeah i'm gonna you'll just do some good good rehab get back play a few games in the top 14 and the uh, champions cup that's left and then there's a big uh, preparations uh, two months of preparations left for the world cup has it generally been quite a frustrating time personally because obviously you looked pretty good in the first four rounds but you mentioned the autumn and we had a chat I think it was towards the end of last season and you were so excited about that game against South Africa in November and then yeah. were forced to miss that and obviously you missed a large part of the kind of the the summer after injuring yourself at the end of last season so has it been a yeah. quite a tricky tricky time? Yeah no exactly this this last year has been uh, has been one of the challenge, challenging ones you know, as a as as a rugby player in your career, you always have, you know, the the good years and the bad years. So this is one of the or good and difficult, I would say. But uh, um, this is one of my difficult years because it's I started off with a big uh, ligament injury. It was the second time I've done it, so I had to get an operation, which is not never ideal. Um, and then came back from that, uh, prepared, had gone. Uh, had motivation to come back for that uh, November test series to play that game. So I had like f- played five to 14 games before I went there. So everything went, went well. And then when I got there, got a small hamstring there, came back, uh, started playing with the club again eventually. Felt good. Went to the Six Nations now. And luckily, I you know, at least played four games, but I wasn't 100%. And then it went again a little, a little thing. So yeah, it's, it's just trying to get back in and get a get a get a niggle and then fall a bit just by building yourself up again and then fall back so yeah this this has been a little bit of a difficult season for me so far something to be said for having chicken legs mate not having massive <laughs> hamstrings that need to strengthen up just having <laughs> little chicken wings that you can't tear like mine um how are you generally like when you're injured some boys walk around they're like bears with sore heads some boys they don't mind the rehab. Like, which side of the fence are you on? Like, obviously, this year has been super frustrating and annoying yeah. for you. But generally, what are you like? Because you get some people that are absolute disasters, and some boys that actually mm. take control of rehab club and are good fun to be around. So, which side are you on? Yeah. So now in my career, now that I've I've had like almost eleven years professional, I've kind of gotten it down because it's it's happened a few times already. So I, I normally take my one or two days that I do whatever I need to do to get it to get it off my chest, the frustrations. So either that's coming home and eating everything I see. Or, Amen. <laughs> or, or whatever it's been just chilling out. Or even my wife knows as well. Like if I injury, like she leaves me alone for like one day, one or two days. And then do whatever. If I need to cry, I'll cry. If I need to eat, I'll eat or whatever I need to do. But normally it's food for me, though. So, because <laughs> uh, uh, you normally, you really, really on a, on a tight uh, a diet and stuff like everything is, it's like, it's really fatiguing uh, to be on top of your, your food and your, your diet and all of that. So when something happens, you know, okay, well, I'm not going to do something for a while. So I let myself go for like one or two days. And then after that, I make a conscious decision. So, okay, listen, it's done. It's finished now. Now start looking ahead and start getting back. But yeah, if it's, if, if it's happened a few times in the same year, that's a bit difficult. The third or fourth time that you get, okay, you need to go again. So whenever she, whenever your wife sees you get injured, she basically stocks the fridge and leaves for a day or two, and then comes back and says, "Right, that's it. Come on." Yeah, Crack yeah, on. that's most yeah. Because when I get home, there's there's lots of food waiting for me. Like not even <laughs> not even in the fridge, just on the table, like freshly <laughs> bought or some baked uh, some baked uh, baked uh, sweet stuff. Uh, you know, she, she knows she knows how to <laughs> how to treat. Me. I don't want to talk or nothing. I just want to get in there. Say hello and start eating. Red meat and red wine. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Mate, enough of the injury chat. Let's rewind the clock a little bit. Back to Twickenham. How big a result was that for you? Were you surprised by how it unfolded? And what was it like for the squad? Yeah, it was a pretty big build-up for us as well. Because we had we had that match against Ireland that did, well, it obviously didn't go away. And uh, that was kind of a big moment for us. Because, yeah, we didn't perform like we nearly like we we wanted to or planned we did stuff that we never did normally and it was it was really a difficult 
came for us, but we knew because we lost it. We just gave it to them. Like it's it's different when you when you knew like okay, you played your best game and the other team team won. You know, okay, they were better. Fine, take it. But we made so many mistakes, uh, discipline and handling errors, which we normally don't do. And our kicking game was poor. So yeah, so then we lost it. And with that, you obviously lose the Grand Slam and all that because we also wanted to do, to go for that a second time. So you you, lo you lose that and everything. Uh, and the loss and the Grand Slam. So now, is a, what's our next objective? So luckily it came up that the the English team with we, we've not never well, it's been eighteen years. Mm -hmm. The last time we've won them in the Six Nations. So that that came up, and luckily, like every single Six Nations, there was always like something to go and look for, uh, some type of record or or whatever. So uh, the whole staff and everybody like I felt like jumped on that and said, okay, well. Let's go and create our history because our motto it's 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 is our jersey and our our, our 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 story. So we said, okay, to build our legacy as our team, this will be an awesome thing to have. So we kind of use that as a motivation. So, uh, and then for for Fabian, our coach, it was personally for him. It was also like a really big match. Like I've never seen him really switch on like this in a, in a team meeting or during the week because. Uh, you could kind of feel during the week this is uh, a little bit more more important than the other, uh, than the previous games I point. Is that because it was as far back as two thousand and five? Is there a bit of kind of it's England? Yeah, well, there's always that part. But no, <laughs> it's England. <laughs> yeah, there's always that part. But I think, yeah, personally for him, for him as a player as well, there were some I think some some games there in the in the past that was difficult for him. Um, and then, yeah, the part that it's England. Um, but yeah, I think because it, 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 it falls nicely into our, you know, into our, our kind of objective into creating our history as our team and, and really solidifying our team as something special in the, uh, in, uh, in the French rugby history to make sure that we, we stand out and that we, we were a special team. It's, it's all these little, little things, these little records that I think maybe in 20 years' time, people will remember this team. If you've had a few of those things, because it will constantly pop up the next time, the next time a, a team comes and plays uh, England, there will always be our team's name. So that, that's that's pretty, pretty cool. And Johnny chatted about it before that Twickenham game that you were perhaps a bit more well-rested than usual. In the fallow week, you'd been given maybe a bit more time off than usual. Was that the case? And did you feel kind of physically sort of as fresh as you possibly could be going into that one yeah yeah because we we had a whole week off uh i think before that game so that was quite and we and we really so this time we tried something different with our um with the preparator physique the conditioning coach where he really said he wants us to to be physically good at the end of this of the of the series so that means like really pumping it hard the first two games might play with some fatigue and then backing that we that will we'll win the games and then slag off the training like way more than normally so you do less at the end but then you feel fresher because you did it already done a hard training in the beginning so we we tried that which meant that we played Italy really really fatigued um, and Ireland a little bit but then England we were like 100% fresh so I think well, it kind of showed like it it, it it worked in a sense, yeah. Mate, it certainly worked. By the way you performed, like it was some game. Um, yeah. And like there was some chat previously in the week as well, like leading up, you were talking about Mario Toje and you'd said some nice things about him in the build-up, but you also thought he was more of a back rower than a lock as well, which I laughed yeah. at. But like, <laughs> how, how much did you enjoy these battles on the field as well? Because it was completely dominant from a French perspective, really. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, after the game, I had a... I had a few chats with uh, chats with the uh, with the boys afterwards and yeah, yeah for them obviously it was just like nothing went their way mm. and uh games and them they always they uh, they told me like normally if you lose a game you can say like, but at least we had them in the in the in the scrums or we had them in a in the lineups or something but it was quite neutral or a little bit our our side even with the set pieces and all that as well 
So I think just everything went really well for us during that game, and I, and I think we were really prepared. But yeah, we also changed changed our, our game plan a little bit regarding our, our our exits, just to catch them off guard for what they thought they were going to receive. So that also helped. But then as well, like Intermark and uh, Antoine. Uh, you can't. I, I don't know if you you're playing against them. Like even in top fourteen, when you play against them, like you can't really prepare they're not bad. against them because they're they, not bad. Eh? They, he pulls stuff out of his head, the magic head. But like you can't. Sometimes it just goes well. And I think like literally almost every single opportunity that we had in that game, we we capitalized. And Johnny mentioned Mario there. He did. He he did speak nicely about him. He said he disrupts the game. He obviously are well aware of what kind of a player he is. But it's like other coaches have picked him in the back row. Some coaches have picked him in the second row. So, you know, you think he's a back row, eh? Yeah, I know, because um, it was like a kind of inside joke for, for me, myself, because I normally give all the locks that I play with, the the loose head locks, I all I give them all crap because I tell them, no, it's only there's only in today's rugby, there's only one real lock left. Yeah. You know, and it's a tight head, <laughs> a tight head lock. So I give, I, give, I give all of them a bit of a, 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 a go. And telling them no when they call themselves locks, I'm like, oh, that's that's weird because yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in modern rugby you're seen as a fourth Lucy, you know, like because uh, that's <laughs> not. And I, I like to pride myself on, on the idea that there's only one real lock left in today's rugby. But yeah, like, it's funny about that thing because it was a quick interview I did at the end of the game, and then at the end of the island game, I think, yeah. Uh, and then that article went like to South Africa in the SR Rugby magazine and stuff, and they were like just headline. Uh, yeah, Paul Williams just says, uh, "My authority <laughs> is not a lock." <laughs> Click no, but I spoke. I spoke about him because um, they asked me about him, and I was saying about that he's really a type of disruptor, like everybody knows, and he's actually helped me to add some few things into my game that I never would have thought of. So, no, he's definitely. Uh, not the most physical guy, but he has a massive work rate and he's a disruptor. And I, and I think that's why you want him in your team, team every single kid. You're not, you're not, you're not going to put him there to, to run over everyone in the whole team. No, you're going to put him there to disrupt and crash the momentum and disrupt the line up malls and all that stuff. That's, that's why he's there. And I think that's what he's best at. And then on the back of all this, your teammate, Zach Mercer, helps the situation. I understand he was winding you up as well, saying, you know, your type <laughs> of lock, Paul, the long gone. It's the Marrow and Ollie Chess, and they're the future. Yeah, yeah, I know. We have a go at each other. Every single day keeps it interesting. <laughs> and he, he lost a decent bet on the back of that as well, old Zachy. So, yeah, did you see, yeah, you yeah. saw the posts. Yeah, no, no, no that's sure there's, these uh, Frenchies that didn't make him forget about that. But <laughs> Exactly. Awesome. And, mate, another lock, your loose head partner who has gone, come on, leaps and bounds throughout the tournament. You've been packing down next to him, Thibaut Flamont. What have you made of his progression? Like, because to come in and, you know, massive game time with Toulouse over the past two seasons now, but becoming one of the world, the bet, the world's best loose headlocks, we won't say tight headlocks to upset you, but one of the best <laughs> number fours in the business. He's, it's been amazing yeah. to see his evolution. Yeah, I know. He's really, he's really like progressed since, since uh, his first few caps uh, did last year. Um, yeah, and I'm really impressed with him. I think uh, uh, that's why I always feel like if you have the opportunity um, to start playing international rugby when you're a young rugby player, that that changes so many things in your rugby career and it like puts you on a fast track of learning and gaining experience. So because I started played played later in my career um, international rugby and the stuff that I learned, it like gave me a new breath of fresh air and something new to start thinking about and learn new things when I started playing international. So to have that when you're younger, he's just going to be better and better, I think, every single year right? because there's nothing. Because at the moment, if he's playing like this with with the limited experience, experience he has with his age, that's just going to improve. So, yeah, I'm quite excited to see him in the future because, uh, like I say, he's just going to start adding new things into his game and uh, be more precise, be more, uh, uh, yeah, ready for all types of situations. So this, I just think he's gonna get better and better because yeah, he's really been improved. He's really improved a lot since the last year. It's really interesting what you were saying about the Ireland game and the way the tournament kind of unfolded for you guys, with you kind of front loading all the physical preparation and then being a bit fresher towards the end. So when you factor that in as well, 
the island game the ball in playtime was incredible yeah. it was like 46 <laughs> minutes so if you're already that, knackered you're going to be knackered yeah, at the end of that exactly that was probably the that was probably in international all the international games i've played that was probably the one that i've been the most tired because because we yeah we, we we attacked like in a half trying to get out of a half and then we would knock on the ball they would kick it through and then chase down make a tackle in your own 22 and then start defending for like 10 phases again it, it was crazy and then then for some way we get a penalty or a turnover then we kick it long we don't kick it out they we chase they come back with the with the counter attack and then it's the same just poof go through turn around run back our, our forwards that game were, were dead but what was it part of strategy because you played out of your 22 so much you tried to keep the ball in play you didn't put the ball off the field so is this a plan that you haven't been told about and now you're angry because you were exhausted during the game or was it like did Antoine yeah. and Roman did they have a plan to keep the ball on the field and play out or was it not something that was discussed no because we kind of we kind of have a uh, sick play like we don't play in our own half stuff but we always leave a little bit of hit a little bit of uh, play for guys like Antoine and, uh, and Demak to do what they need to, and then we just need to react. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we were just, we weren't just, because sometimes you'd see us start picking, picking going in the 50, but it's, it's always, it happens when somebody, when a player makes like 10 or 20 yards. So if you do a pick and go in your own half, it's fine if that guy runs like 10 or 50 meters, because then you're on a front foot. Uh, it's fine. It's like it counts as, as a type of an exit. But yeah, I just think in that game, like the forwards didn't didn't do it. I think like Antonio Pond left us opportunities to do that stuff, but we just didn't take them. And then they tried to force it, I think, a little bit to make something happen from the middle of the field. Um, yeah, I think if you look back on it, it's just, I think we should have seen it a bit quicker in the game start recognizing a bit quicker and adapting and say okay listen nothing is working for us now let's just just kick it and spare spare the forwards uh, a little bit of energy but oh, yeah, that type of games happen so no oh, I, I think if we if, if we faced Ireland a little bit later in the Six Nations it would have been a different story because uh, we also didn't have a great performance against Italy mm -hmm. um because yeah, you know, and that and that was nothing to do with energy. That was just we made too many too many mistakes, too many penalties. Um, yeah, so I think just some a bit of rust, or, or I don't know what to hell. But they, those first two games weren't weren't our best. Aside from the Ireland game, obviously, as soon as you lose that game, you know you can't achieve your ultimate goal of winning the Grand Slam, and it was always going to be a a stretch and you were relying on them to slip up to to win the tournament so when you look back on the tournament as a whole obviously it will be naturally a bit of a disappointment because you wanted to win the title you wanted to win the grand slam but how do you rate it from a french perspective what went well and what areas are there to be improved on do you think i think the the thing that i can well i personally will take away is that um i think this tournament we saw that we were capable of adapting really quick and making changes in our game plan really quick, um, which before and like all the previous six inches, we kind of had our game plan and it was kind of set <clears throat> and we didn't go out of it. We just stick to it. And it, it was quite necessary when because we had a younger group, place experience and all that. So I've kind of felt like the evolution of, of our team growing up and gaining more experience and being more comfortable in these high pressure games. Um, and during the weeks, because uh, we straight after the Italy game, we almost sorted out completely our discipline thing. And then after the after the island game, uh, I felt like it just clicked. We we our kicking game was on point after that. So I think being able to do that because we we also made a few changes in our game plan. Like we started uh, doing tactical things, and uh, especially in the England game. Our exits, we changed our exit game plan, and then uh, Antoine and and uh, Demak they they made some few decisions by themselves on the fly, that uh, which were really really awesome for us. So I kind of for me that the the positive thing I take away from this season is just uh, seeing the evolution, and I think that can play a big part in the World Cup when you have if you go like you have a few games in a row that you maybe need to change up the game plan, uh, put in a few changes uh, 
So the staff has been, since I think last season, they've been switching up the game plan a little bit. And I think that's helped us now. Now we are able to, we've got now, like I think you can say like a basket of two or three main different game plans that we can just adjust on, on the fight because we've already done them through the year. So that for me, that's a big positive. It's a real big positive, especially in a World Cup year. Like just picking on what you're saying, because you've got other teams like England and Wales that are going to come into the tournament and be unsettled. But what you guys have now are the foundations, like the building blocks and a confidence in the way you play. Mm. And then it might take a special something from an Intermac or an Antoine Dupont or a Valencia at a World Cup. Like you've seen moments from like Johnny Wilkinson, Matt Dawson sneaking some some ground and knocking over a drop goal. We've seen New Zealand dropping a ball through the middle of a French lineup and going through to win big games. So like, it's, it's amazing now that I see like a platform, an organization, a physicality that's all like top level. And then there's going to be this tiny little bit that divides the top nations come September, October time. And I believe you've got the players to do it. Like it's an exciting time, which is really cool. I was going to ask you, we didn't even talk about the Welsh game. It was probably the first thing we should have mentioned, but <laughs> like we're, we're, we skipped it. Where are you in Paris? Like, what did you make of the game at the weekend? What were the takeaways? What did you, were you in the stadium? Were you part of the debrief? Or were you watching it from home? And what did you make of the, the Welsh game, the last game um, in general? Yeah, I've, yeah, not... I don't have a, a big of an opinion of the game because I was uh, I was sent back home to start to start my rehab, and obviously I wasn't at home for a while, so I was watching the game. You were eating. With, uh, with four, you, you started eating. eating. <laughs> <laughs> so with greasy fingers from eating my lamb chops, my barbecue <laughs> lamb chops, and uh, uh, four kids running around. So yeah, I was I was keeping an eye on the game, but I wasn't really following it like intensely. Um, I think for me it was mostly just to take a break and switch off a little bit, because uh, it it also hurts, you know, when you when you when you watch those games, you're like, damn, should have could have could have played another test match. And we've uh, spoken about the positives. Obviously, this this stats don't mean anything necessarily to you guys, but to Sean Edwards, I bet they do because he he your the early stages of your evolution certainly as a team were based on having a really solid defence. And they still obviously are to a certain extent. And he had this record of only ever conceding four tries once in like 76 games in the Six Nations. And then in this tournament, obviously, perhaps because of the evolution and the way that you're trying to change things up, he goes and concedes four tries a couple of times. So yeah. is he absolutely raging? Or does he kind of get that it's part of the bigger picture? Yeah, no, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't like it at all. I <laughs> think. But it's just him. Uh, I think that's why he's in our team because he's really he makes everybody like um, excited about defense and makes it a bit a little bit more important than we normally think about the defense in teams. So that's his thing. Like, uh, and everybody knows it. So uh, we always try to achieve his uh, his uh, goals that he that he sets out for for each and every game, and everybody respects him uh, in that way. So we kind of know. He's going to go crazy or uh, <laughs> he's not going to take it well. But at the end of the day, like say winning is the most important. It doesn't matter how, how you do it. So if you kind of uh, kind of start school, if they score four tries against you, you just need to go score five, you know? <laughs> so yeah, luckily we, I've, but we felt, we feel solid. Like we don't feel like it, our defense is a weakness at all. And I think, We've had this uh, pretty solid defense for like four years almost now. So other teams are also like evolving and they're also getting better with the attacking system. So they're going to look for all those little weaknesses and all those little cracks, um, which in the beginning, nobody expected us to have a solid defense. Uh, so yeah, that also plays a role and it's just, you know, it gets difficult every, it's get more, it gets more difficult every single season, but still today we don't, we don't feel like our defense is a weakness at all. It's a few, like the tries that people score against us normally is like really, it's it's difficult tries to to defend in any case. So, um, yeah, um, yeah. But outside of that, yeah, yeah Sean, Sean, uh, <laughs> yeah, he he has some expectations and he doesn't take it lightly. He doesn't take the things lightly. Yeah. We'll ask you again when you've joined up with the France camp next time. See if he's uh, <laughs> see if he's happy or not. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Mate, another guy, have to ask you, Damian Peno, 26 yeah. years old, already joint top try scorer with Philippe Sella, Serge Blanco. 
Um, how good is he like to play with? Yeah, he's he's like for me, he's the definition of a finisher, like Greek, uh, the a typical wing finisher. Just if you get the ball to him, like you, you like almost fifty percent, like fifty fifty, it's gonna be a try or not? Yeah, because he he's gonna make something amazing out of it. Um, um, uh, yeah, so yeah, because he, he just does a uh, and. And I love his uh, his expressions. You see him laughing while he's carrying the ball sometimes, because that's the type of guy he is. Uh, always laughing and taking nothing seriously. Mate, that's the best bit. Like his character. Like, can you give a, again? Because obviously, it's a language barrier for everyone in English. But of all the things you see, whether it's him singing at the top of his lungs, like screaming with his laptop, or smiling, like you say, what is he like as a character? Is he away with the fairies? Is he completely away with it? Or what's he like as a bloke? No, no, we like it's the uh, typical like Stifler character, you know, like uh, <laughs> <laughs> so because he he's crazy. Uh, everybody will be silent, and and you just hear him laughing like like really loud <laughs> in a, in a gym or something. Uh, always, yeah, always laughing, joking, uh, taking nothing serious. Always a smile, always friendly, um, looking for a joke. Yeah, that's a uh, lots of energy high energy guy and you need those kind of guys in a team don't you does he almost play up to it a little bit because he kind of knows that's his role in the team to kind of lighten the mood at times or is he just naturally just yeah no i nuts? honestly think he's just naturally like <laughs> he's just naturally uh like that like uh yeah i can't explain he's, he's a unique character and it i think that what makes the whole team like him a lot though. And you were down in Cap Breton near Johnny for the preparations for this tournament during the tournament as well. I think that's going to be similar ahead of the World Cup. So give us a sense of what it was like. Was that a bit different to usual and how much you enjoy that? Yeah, that's the first time we went there. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it on the beach. Um, so the training fields were, were were really nice. We enjoyed it. They they moved the whole, the whole uh, basically built the second gym was there with all new cages and weights and everything so um yeah the weather wasn't that wasn't <laughs> the best though sorry um, sorry yeah, but uh, but i think during the world cup it will be it will be fine it will be nice summer and respecting a lot of tourists and all that so thinking that uh the trainings will be like quite full with um with the fans and supporters come and watching the games so we had a few trainings like that uh during the week uh during the, the time that we were there um we we, we had the supporters come and watching the games it was pretty cool it was, it's always nice doing a normal training with supporters around the field because there's a uh, it's a like it's a nice vibe and people are yelling and go crazy and it brings brings some something different to a normal just a normal day's training for us so that was pretty cool, and I think we kind of kind of probably do more more stuff like that during the World Cup. But yeah, um, I think it's it's good to change the scenery a bit because by now all of us I think are just tired of Marcosi because um, we go there all the time and it's in the middle in the middle of nowhere outside of Paris. So um, yeah, and I think the during the summer it's gonna be cool. So we can have training. You can go for a swim in the, in the ocean and chill. I think it'll be a surf. You can go for a surf, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think I'll. I can a body, say. bodyboard, a bodyboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's more, more like just uh, body surfing, right? <laughs> and if you see a man nearby stressed out with his kids with a beer in his hand, it's probably Johnny. Sunburn, <laughs> yeah, very, yeah. very sunburn. That'll be me. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask as well. It's a different. It's a point of difference of coming down to this part of the world and tracking training sessions on the road. Like I was speaking to Thibaut Giroud, who's like your lead conditioner down mm-hmm. in Biarritz the other day. He was saying it's going to be cool. It's going to be like, full, it sounds terrible, like camping, like mobile homes, but like each of the players has their own thing, like an air conditioned, high end, six star. It's going to be super fancy, but mm-hmm. that's been awesome. Like people in this region have loved seeing you guys train, like for all the schools and rugby clubs, for everyone to have that interaction and see the team on the road. It's been amazing. And like the buzz in this little area of, of France, they've been really proud to have hosted you, so it's, it's awesome. Um, I was going to ask you as well, like on the change and mixing up, like Fabian's also had, you know, his messaging sometimes aligned with the French Foreign Legion. He's had Jean Dujardin, the actor, come in. Nicolas Carabatic came in, I think, two weeks ago as well, and like talked about his Olympic medals. Like, what's it been like having those guys come in and give different messaging, but also clearly massive rugby fans? What's it been like having those guys in camp? 
Yeah, no, so we, um, since the start of, like, from uh, 2019 or 2020, when we started started training together, we, um, he's brought in that thing that he wants, like, wherever we can find a spot in the season to get someone, someone that has a, that's an expert in some, some shape or form in a, in a, in a certain area um, to come and have a chat with us and just try and give us a, a different uh, aspect or this dif different view of things. And like, I've really enjoyed it. Um, in the beginning, it was really difficult for me sitting there listening to a, like an hour long speech in French. <laughs> but, but now it's really awesome. Like I really enjoyed it because obviously there's always something to learn and take away from people's experience. No, I believe at least. Um, yeah, so like I've really enjoyed it. It was because uh, every week there's somebody for for someone, you know, like you might not. But it was a big thing for, for Fabian to have a guest in, like to change things up a little bit and do something different. Um, and I think the players appreciate it because we had some interesting people come, come along. And one other thing that was a bit different this tournament was that you obviously know that a couple of the assistants are moving on after the world cup that's kind of already been announced and you know there's going to be a changeover obviously the world cup is the massive focus but is there any difference at all in the fact that knowing the assistants are moving on or is it just much the same as usual no i think because from the start we we plan it as a block preparing for the world cup so all our plans and all our preparations were to to go to the world cup so everything, all our preparations, all the things that we set in place, even from the first year, we had this graph, the whole thing, this whole graph that we said, like, this is what we want to achieve going going up and until finally uh, arriving at the World Cup. So it's like this four-year roadmap that we created as a team and, like, everything has been going as planned. So, yeah, so everybody's just thinking about that. Like, I don't think there's anybody feeling any anything else but it kind of feels like now we'll deal with the other stuff afterwards because um i think there's some maybe some new guys kind of come in and a new new staff and all that so then that will be a, a new block you know with the new expectations and a natural time for people to leave after a world cup so yeah yeah and i guess they, but like all the staff i think for all of them um yeah they obviously some staff want to also become their own head coaches and all that aspirations you have as a coach and it's also i think it's also a, a difficult life as well as being an international coach because uh you're at home but then you lots of times you spend with the team and well, you're not at home so I, I can imagine also it's not a type of lifestyle that all of the coaches want to live for eight years so um yeah now like i said we're just planning for this block and preparing for the world cup which climaxes at the World Cup. So, um, you know, we see it as a block. And, uh, so it's changed nothing in that in that regard. All roads lead to the World Cup. That's what you've been building for, clearly. Yeah. Um, it's probably been spoken about the whole way through. You've got that in the back of your minds. Psychologically, is there a difference not winning the Grand Slam? So if you'd won the Grand Slam, you would have been heavy favourites, right? That's what everyone's billing Ireland as now. Is it potentially a good thing to have lost that game in Dublin, to have had that little hit, and then psychologically have a little bit more hunger. I'm not sure if you can have more hunger, if that is possible, but where would you have rather been mentally? Would you rather won that Grand Slam? That's a stupid question. Of course, you'd rather win the Grand Slam, but... Yeah, no, no, mentally... no but I get, I get what you mean. I get Do you know what I'm mean. trying to say? Yeah, like, yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah. is it a better place mentally to be in, having that little itch that needs to be scratched yeah. coming around the well, corner? Well, I was, I was laughing the last World Cup, seeing how all the teams in the media were fighting to be the underdog. <laughs> like all the teams are like no 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 um uh ireland is probably the four the head said africa saying no we think we're the underdogs ireland is probably the favorite and then ireland says no we think england is probably the favorite we're the underdog so you had like all these teams it was quite funny like everybody just uh fighting to be the underdog um so yeah like everybody loves the underdog um because uh, then it kind of if you lose, it's it's okay. No, nobody expected more. But if you win, it's so much so, uh, more amazing or whatever. But um, yeah, I think even though we lost that game, we still have a big expectation on us. 
a big like we especially favorites in France, of course, <laughs> from, the, from the French public, we are the favorites. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we because we also had like a 14 game winning streak that was also on our hanging on our shoulders, I think. Um, and I think if you go into like that winning streak thing, because you kind of for me as a player, I kind of think about the, the media, is for me, is the pressure, um, especially in modern day rugby. Like the match is fine, the match is fine, but then all you see every day is those little snippets of of, of headlines and media and stuff like that. So, um, and then basically the the, the 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 basic tactic of the media is building you up high just to break you down because it sells, you know. So, um, so you kind of know when you're going on a forty match winning streak, you know that day that it's gonna fall down. It's gonna be a whole week or two weeks of just some bad media, and like we like we had off the island, like for like it's funny how to how to see everybody just jumping on that bandwagon, and obviously the media people pr uh, pushing the type of articles and in interviews that that's kind of negative after a loss like that. What kind of things were said? Because obviously in the UK, we don't kind of see it from a French perspective. Yeah, no, no, uh, no, it was for us now. The, the rain is over. Uh, this is finished now. And we, 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 we weren't as good as we thought. And then you also had like old players doing interviews and just bashing. Oh, over. it's always <laughs> them. It's yeah, always it's, them. It's crazy. I'm like, what? Like, surely if you're a player, why? But I think, yeah, kind of, yeah, I think it's easy for for them. Like they get a they, ask for interview. They've got to earn money somewhere, aren't they? They've got to. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, and then yeah, nobody's gonna like it if you if you stick up for the team. Like you need those controversial headlines, bro. So yeah, so they they end up. So for me, I think going into a World Cup where you've already gotten that out of the way, um, that that big loss. Because I think if you build up and you and you arrive at the World Cup with like a seventeen or eighteen game winning streak it would be crazy because now you'll be touching like world records almost because uh, i think what the world record was like 20 or 19 or something like that. yeah it was 18 wasn't it? all blacks in england yeah I, yeah, yeah yeah i think it's like that so so now if you arrive with that there's some added pressure I, while you still have to go do a quarter finals a semi-finals and a final so i think just to avoid to have a potential extra pressure on you is better so if you for me, if you look in that regards, I think the the loss we can use the loss to help us eventually. But as a player, I would still say, like you said, would have would have liked to won it to 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 have won that game. But but yeah, I think in in a grand scheme, in a in a bigger picture, I think it will be a positive for us. And mate, plenty of boys that performed really well amongst the Irishmen. You got Caelan Doris, Hugo Keenan, Mac Hansen, Thomas Ramos, Damian Penno. And Antoine Dupont, all nominated for Player of the Tournament. Mm. Who gets it and why? Well, I don't. I don't want to make that decision though. Who gets uh, it? Why yeah. is Paul Willemser on the not on the list? Like we we no, never get no, any second no. row love. Thibaut Flamon could be up there. We we'll give it to him, yeah. Yeah, he can, he can, he can, he can. But uh, yeah, no, I don't know. But it's normally with those with those trophies. It's normally the try scorers or. Uh, that has the the most beautiful tries, and then I I only get cauliflower ears to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, no, I think it'd be difficult, but I think Peno, I think Peno is a is a is a, is a massive, uh, um, yeah, candidate for me, um, because uh, yeah, but because uh, Anton de Pont, he, he's been setting the bar so high. He can't get it every year, can he? Yeah, and and I think that it's like when you have people playing the best games of rugby when they're international. Um, as soon as they just play a normal game, everybody says, "No, nah, he's he's bad now" or whatever. But it's because you, you like the, everybody is used to him playing at like hundred percent peak. So for me, like he set the bar so high. So I think it's difficult. It's going to be difficult to, to be impressed more by Anton de Pont because everyone is already there. So I think uh um I think a good guy that that's been like had like a slow build up through the years and uh, there's an awesome season. I think uh Damien Pono for me would be a, a good uh, a 
good candidate. Now we know that he's really like Steve Stifler as well. I'm like, he yeah. has to get it. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, st- yeah. The, the Stiffmeister for playing yeah, the tournament exactly. would be epic. I think on Antoine as well, because everyone gets so used to his amazing attacking skills, everyone focused on that tackle on Matt Hansen in this tournament because everyone was almost yeah. like, I mean, we know how strong he is physically, but it was yeah. crazy seeing that. Is it? Can you take a bit of credit for that? Have you have you taught him? That holding the guy <laughs> like that, <laughs> no, no, bro. But I must say, he's really strong for his size. Like you won't, you won't expect him. But he has some intelligence about how to use his body. Like he, he just, I think he's just so in touch with, like kicking from both feet, like doing passes both head. But bro, like I think he's just so in touch with his body. Like I think he has, he has like extra sense of the feeling, like through his whole body, and he can do things that we can't. Um, yeah, so because he's just a special specimen, uh, like any, and he proves it every single weekend. Like, he does some, some little small thing that is like, like, you're like, whoa, I've never seen that before. Like, <laughs> so yeah, no, but yeah, then again, that game he showed a little bit of his physical strength, but it's the same stuff he showed a few times already. Like, he, he him picking the ball and running into all the forwards, and then you think, oh, okay, he's gonna go down, and then all of a sudden, he just pops out. And there's like three guys around him, and nobody gets him down, and he just goes through. Like, do you join in in training as well? Do you kicking off your left foot, that kind of thing? Does he does he let you join in? Yeah, but for me, it's just like in the, in the warm up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't embarrass myself like that, bro. I know I stick to my strengths. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to get too old to try new things now. My special with the hamstrings. No kicking with the hamstrings. No, Look no, after no, those. no, no. And mate, you're about to leave us. You're heading off for a camp up in the hills and you boys are playing against Perpignan this weekend. We should probably touch on top 14 before we, we let you go. Mm. But away to Perpignan this weekend, what's your prep been like? What's the team looking like? And what are the chances of winning in Perpignan? Yeah, so the staff selected to do the the camp this week because um, you know, everybody knows for us it's a big game cause, and for them because they can still stay in the top 14 if they win this game and we can potentially make the make the playoffs if you win this game. So for both of our teams, and it's like a... Derby. It's a derby weekend for everyone. Yeah, so it's, we know it's going to be a massive game and then both teams have something on the line for this game. So we said, no, this will be a perfect opportunity for a little camp, a little team building. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll spend the week there. Um, I'll come back a bit earlier with the injured boys so we can do our things. But yeah, no, it's going to be a massive game and it's going to well, decide decide how we finish the season. So yeah, the pressure is up for us. Uh, but the team is looking good. They've had some holidays. Uh, guys are fresh coming back. So no, I think it's going to be uh, also yeah, a good game. And uh, yeah, we know how important it is. So we <laughs> need one of those games where you need to win. <laughs> And then a little bit of an eye on a trip to Exeter the following week as well, because we often talk about how French teams approach Europe, but that's a massive game. Obviously, they're at home, but there has been a bit more of a focus with you guys on European rugby in the last few years. Presumably, that is a huge target, that game. Yeah, but it's always difficult. Like now, we're struggling a little bit in top 14. So then it's kind of like, let's let's just focus on this uh, Perpignan game. And then, so I guess yeah, if we if yeah if we win this weekend, then yeah, obviously we go hundred percent for that for that game for that exit the game, um, yeah. And then either way, like if we lose this one, it'll be good to then go again for the go at least as far as you can for the Challenge Cup. So yeah, yeah, it's difficult, but yeah, uh, for us at the moment, it's trying to survive in the top fourteen because we're not yet in a position where we really can attack the top six. So for us, it's just to try and get back into the top six of the top 14. Um, that's our main priority. And then obviously, if we did, if we check that box, uh, yeah, then going full steam ahead for that exit again. Have you got a week that you're looking for, mate, in terms of getting back and fitness? When are you hoping to be back? Yeah, it's uh, like two or three weeks. So we'll see depending on how I how I progress and how I feel. So yeah, because it's a bit touch and go this time because it's the second time I've had the, this type of hamstring thing. So yeah, we obviously want to make sure that we don't repeat the same the same mistake or the same scenario. Absolutely. Don't rush back. Thanks so much for joining us and yeah. um, giving us a bit of inside info. And yeah, have a bit more food, relax a bit and come back stronger. <laughs> no, I'm not eating, bro. I'm, not, I'm cutting now again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ray. Appreciate it.
Thanks, mate. Enjoy camp. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Straight back to the grind for Paul, Johnny. But um, God, what he was saying then about front loading the tournament in terms of preparing physically, mate. What they were like going into that Ireland game. I mean, I'm like, why not just have light team runs every week? <laughs> like, if everyone's absolutely bust, everyone's gone through the grind of the marathon in the top fourteen. Just give them a team run, make them train on a Thursday, team building Monday, Tuesday. And they'd be fine. Like, it's all part of a master plan. Thibaut Giroud is an absolute machine, uh, loved by everyone that's worked with him. It isn't easy. Like This is the thing you get to the end of the Six Nations period. And everyone's like, oh, what will they be doing in training? Like, how will they get... Like, at the end, you literally do a team run. Like, you do as little as you can. You bandage everyone together because it's so physical and off you go. But that's it. The different cycles and the different approaches that different unions and federations have because they look after the players in different ways. But clearly, everything clicked for them against England. Um and even though they maybe felt a bit stodgy physically in the early games, they still managed to get through and win, um, Ireland being the exception. But it will all be part of the master plan. It was to win that Six Nations. They were there, thereabouts, um, and now they'll have a real prep. Um, they've got all their dates booked in at Cap Breton. They've got all their squad announcements all set to go. Um, and I reckon Fabian and T will be ready to get them all down to the Southwest, get them all training the way they want them to and get them prepped and primed for the World Cup, which is fast approaching. Like, it's not far away now at all. Right. We should find out what your meter moment of the week is, Johnny. Well, he teed it up nicely for us, didn't he? Damien, the stiff man, Peno, which yeah. I absolutely <laughs> love. The stiff meister. Um, look, he's only 26, which is freakish, but 14 tries already. The French six and five nations try scoring record tied with Sella and Blanco. If you look at the all-time list as well, I've got it in front of me. He's got 26 international tries overall. So he's already ahead of Christy Dominici, Emil Intermac. Ahead of him, he's got Sela, Santandre, Vincent Clair, and Serge Blanco. But again, a boy that's playing rugby with a big smile on his face, creating absolute havoc and finishing like a fiend. So a uh, meter moment of the week this weekend goes to Damian Penno, a.k.a. Steve Stifler. <laughs> there we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better, the game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven or in a pan and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10 and you'll get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. We touched on the top 14 very briefly with Paul, Johnny, but some yep. big games this weekend. Mate, it's the Derby weekend, um, which is massive for a lot of these clubs now, given the timing of these games, the Six Nations that's just passed. Um, I'll be down I'll be down in person at Bayonne against Poe on the Saturday, so I'm going to take my boys down there. I think I'm going to make a family day out. Maybe all five of us will go down, but that's been moved down to San Sebastian in Spain. They've sold 40,000 tickets already. Wow. It's a sellout um, at Real Sociedad's stadium in San Sebastian but going through Clermont Breve is always a big one Leon Toulon Perpignan Montpellier Bordeaux La Rochelle the Paris Derby and Cast Toulouse so loads of big games to look forward to I think I'm working at the, the I think I'm working I hope I'm working I think I'm working at the <laughs> at the Paris Derby as well on a Sunday night with Viaplay so mate looking forward to it. some massive games and loads of teams in need of some points for host of different reasons um but yeah it feels like top 14's back after a little bit of a break during the six nations um and we'll see what form they carry into the games because they'll be absolutely massive it's tight up there isn't there there's a few obviously at the bottom of the table there, there's some massive games but in the playoff hunt you're looking at that paris derby that you're doing Racing need to pull something out and then leon yep. toulon as well there's there's not much to choose between these teams but between all that i mean Paul will be desperate for him down at Bayon. Bayon clinging on to sixth place incredibly at this stage of the season. Racing needs something. They need a win to get back into the top six. Like you mentioned, Cast, who've been struggling massively. Uh, change of coach, Jeremy Davidson's come in, but they need to find some sort of rhythm to stop the rot because it hasn't been going well. And if they keep losing, they're going to find them stuck in the relegation zone themselves. So Perpignan, it's a massive game for them at home to Montpellier. As Paul mentioned, Montpellier trying to find their way back in top six. Perpignan, one avoid relegation. Um, so yeah, loads of different little important games that are going to be huge this weekend and will be telling come the end of the season. Um, and weirdly as well, what state will internationals come back and what prep 
has been done. Everyone's off on camps this week to try and regroup and get together because this weekend is massive, absolutely huge for a whole host of teams in the top four, in the top 14. And Cass struggling down in 11th at the moment, but there's a yep. few rumours, Pierre-Henri Broncon, uh, we know he's got a relationship with Eddie Jones. He could be off to Australia to join yeah, the Yeah, that, that would be a surprising one. I mean, if, if, you, if you dial back maybe two months ago, less. So, I mean, yeah, just before the Six Nations, when Eddie Jones was sacked, it was almost... Pierre Henry was trying to get Eddie to come to cast and do some consulting with Pierre Yves Revol. So uh, I don't know Eddie. His basically his entire staff was resigned from Australian rugby. So he's going to be looking for people to fill shoes and come in and do a job. They've got a relationship that's already there. So it would be an incredible experience as well for Broncon after, after leaving cast um, and a disappointing end to have that type of international experience would be huge. And we chatted a bit about Joshua Tuasova last week and the interesting situation going on there. Read a little snippet this week that one of the things he said was that there were not enough international schools for his kids in Paris. In Paris, mate, <laughs> you are clutching at straws. If that's the <laughs> if that's the excuse you're going to give is that you can't find a national school in Paris, uh, then I've heard it all. Look, there's obviously something happened. Either Leon won him back, or there's another side that have offered more. Um, but there's not going to be many more international schools than in one of the biggest cities in the world. So. Of all the excuses. I mean, you could have said, like, the bins aren't very good or anything, but <laughs> they're not striking. Schools. They're striking yeah. up there at the minute. It doesn't look safe. Because, like, weirdly, there's loads of things going on in France at the minute. Strikes and there's riots kicking off as well. Um, hmm. But international schools, not yeah. high in there. There's definitely some of them in Paris, mate. 100%. Absolutely. Any other transfer gossip for us? Uh, Rob Simmons, the Aussie hmm. second war from London Irish, looks like he's making his way to Claremont. That could be one of the big moves since Christoph Urios um, has taken up the head post there. They're looking to shore up their line out, which historically hasn't been good at Claremont. It's been one of the weakest parts of their game going back 10, 15 years, bizarrely. Uh, Yannick Uyut moving from Toulouse to Toulon. Um, so he'll be following in the boots of Sele Tolafua as well, who's already making his way down there. Um, an interesting move. A young guy that is Gif as promise. Um, interesting decision to leave Toulouse and head down to Toulon, but um, Toulon, have obviously, Toulon have obviously decided that there's a gamble worth taking, bring him down there, pay, bring him out of his contract um, and give him some more game time in, in the Rad. So yeah, interesting move for Yannick Uyut. Thanks, Johnny, and massive thanks to Paul for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can, check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube, and we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, mate. Bye.